is really uh, you know what you were 20 20 years ago and i'm a very different person i have to say you know i was i don't know how many of you will relate to this so i was a fresh graduate uh, in economics uh, from punjab university working part time in delhi with uh, ge and you know i really just a stock cap job to get some money and i was hanging out usually i think my day job was to hang out with my friends in the evenings uh, you know painting the town red so to speak and you know much to the disappointment disappointment of my parents uh, and if you speak to some of my college friends and school friends you know which, which i hope you don't uh, they will not get over how serious i am and my life has become now and what you know the serious job that i have because at that point of time when i was 20 21 i i just wanted to get over with my undergrad and not have to study again so it's not really a conscious choice to be in this field i mean i when i say serendipity i really mean serendipity i was interested in art painting i was interested in sports so i used to play basketball and tennis uh, but i was not interested in education the, and the world of uh, development was far from my from my mind and from my you know, think like my to do list it was very short term really my to do list and i used to spend the weekends actually you know applying for mba courses and mostly in an effort to convince my parents that i was serious about my future and i think at that point of time in in this is 20 years ago mba was the next big law and mba were the two big things uh, my father is is he's a bureaucrat and one thing he told me was don't apply to the civil services and i was like okay so what can i what else can i do so you know any lost soul says okay let's just sit down for an mba course and that's what i really i was doing uh, and at one point i even tried to convince my father to let me go to afghanistan to work on some temp you an assignment that a friend of mine uh, told me about um so i was really you know what you have would have called a lost soul at, at that point of time i was also very influenced by existentialist literature if you may i some of my favorites have been uh, zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance uh, waiting for godo and you know except that you know i think about it you know i was recently speaking at this uh, webinar and the, and the term of the topic was measuring impact waiting for godo and it just brought back memories and you know i i share one with you that looking back i realized that i thought i was estragon but i was probably vladimir waiting to be told what to do or to be hit by this epiphany uh, and and not really the estragon where i thought i was who sort of represents a more um i would say the the existent ideal existentialist portion of of uh, you know humanity who chooses to stop waiting uh, take control construct meaning of life based upon you know what your physical experiences in your world is around you and just move forward with it so that i that was not me but i thought it was me at that point of time uh, i i don't believe in god i'm not spiritual but i did have faith that there was something greater than me you know i was you know i was meant for a higher purpose than wasting my time looking for a job and a degree i was reading omar khayyam's poetry uh, and imagine myself as a deep thinker but anyway i this is this is really i'm talking 20 years ago uh, i used to write a lot at that point of time and i i don't know I, you know you're smiling lavinia but you know i you, you have a fantastic uh, you know background very impressive cv and i had just introduced you and you've already done the very different things already uh, i mean i see my colleagues in jpal today you know anaita and and uh, you know prerna prashant sir a lot of the uh, people who are niharika who are in this uh, group with you as well in the women in economic policy i am continually impressed by how, how driven you are um because that was not me 20 years ago i i think people today you young folks have a lot more uh, focus and maybe it comes with exposure because i came from a very different generation uh, so thankfully prasam happened to me in my early 20s uh, it was a very down to earth moment for me frankly uh, at the beginning i was really taken aback when i joined pratham and if you told me that i would have left all of my intellectual musings and my comfortable house in newtons delhi i and go to a basti in Uh, Silampur in northeast Delhi, I, and you know, knock on people's doors and ask if the children are going to school. I would not have imagined it. I joined Pratham in 2002 as a, for a very short summer internship. They were looking at that point of time for someone with computer skills to track the. Um, they had these community bridge courses that they were running, and they were getting children into admission into government schools, and that was really. You know, early years of Pratham as well, and they were also figuring out you know what their models should be. that was a time when enrollment levels in india were not at this 98% that you see now actually before the pandemic i don't know what it is going to be now once schools reopen because we see we are hearing about a lot of kids who would have dropped out and then there was this massive push to enroll kids into school 
So quality of learning wasn't even on the agenda at that point of time. Uh, computers and internet had just come into the country, not what you see today. We had floppy disks and these very old, you know, age-old computers and dial-up internet and all of that. But I always had a very keen interest in technology, and that's always been with me throughout. And my father is a technocrat, so we had a computer at home, and I taught myself, you know, Excel, Microsoft, uh, you know, Access, which is a computer software program, very archaic now, and Excel, Word, all of those things. I, you know, I fought through this MS Office for Dummies series. Uh, to be able to, you know, educate myself, but then that also helped me in the job that I was doing as a summer internship with uh, Pratham. Now, at the end of summer, and you know, like I said, I was quite, I didn't really have a plan. So at the end of summer, after having sort of built this database of children for Pratham's Delhi-based programs, tracking them into government schools, and then moving on to uh, sort of looking at their pre-post learning results in the Pratham's bridge classes and in government schools, I got very interested actually in how sort of data was being used to look at learning impacts, how, you know, and how Pratha was continually improving their program design and their method and their tests based upon the results that we were seeing. So this, you know, when reflecting back, this had a very important bearing on my course later on, because I took a course at LSE, I, I talk a little bit about that later, and then later on as my job in JPAL as a research associate. Um, so I stayed on in Pratham after that summer to really to satiate my interests. And I also enjoyed the fieldwork aspect of it. Uh, in, in Delhi, I started off in Delhi in the urban slums, and it was a one and a half hour uh, DTC bus ride to Silampur in North Shahadra. I'd made my peace with it at one point, and we didn't have metros like you have today. At one point, I remember walking, you know, there was a narrow gully and there was a camel which had blocked the road, blocked the gully. And I was like, how do I get under this camel? So I literally walked under the legs of the camel thinking, I hope he doesn't pee on me. And, you know, it's like you know, all sorts of crazy experiences I've had, um, but I mean, those were some of the more you know, offbeat experiences, but I would say nothing was too big or small for me uh, to do when I was in Patham. So we, you know, I spent hours over the next five years, I stayed on and, you know, I spent hours formatting surveys, uh, you know, proofreading line by line, deleting double entries of children's, matching them to their parents' names, Gali, Basti, uh, siblings spending time in the field, piloting, testing instruments, doing what we call at that point of time dipstick surveys, which is your sample surveys today. Uh, we took overnight buses and made long journeys to many different parts of India where Pratham was working. And by that, by that time I started working, I think about a year or a year and a half uh, into my work in Delhi slums, Pratham expanded their catalytic programs in the communities, uh, sorry, in the rural areas and rural communities of India. So then, you know, I, I very happily hopped onto that bandwagon and went off into the villages, slept in school buildings and block resource centers. Uh, again, you know, when first time in a village, it was a very, very different experience for me because I wasn't just visiting, I was staying there. We stayed in Gauriganj, their first uh, Catholic program was in Bihar and then in, in UP. And in Gauriganj, we, it's a small, now it's a much bigger place, but that time was a really tiny little you know, block town. And I stayed there for about six months and we used to go and get up at, you know, I don't know, 5, 5.30, go off to the fields, come back late in the evening. Uh, you don't know where the next thing was coming from. And it was really just, you know, spending time in the field, learning lots, lots of sweat, lots of uh, putting in long hours, a lot of guts. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. Thoroughly, thoroughly. I would not have traded that for anything in the world. But now at you know, 42, if you tell me to go do that again, yes, I might. Uh, hesitate but at that point of time you know everything it's just you have a lot of uh, gumption you have a lot of excitement and enthusiasm uh, so looking back you know I don't think there was time to even think of which direction I was headed towards but all of these different experiences sort of shaped my thinking my attitude and you know where I you know, the choices I made after that were very reflective of all of these experiences uh, I think the only thing I worked towards at that time when I think about it was my uh, scholarship to do my master's at LSE. I was very, very interested in going there and I had a bunch of colleges that I applied to, but this was on top of my list for the particular course that I applied for. And I remember uh, my father asking me at that point of time to, he didn't believe it. I don't think anyone had any faith in me. So he's like, How, can you count your zeros on the scholarship letter? I was like, I've made it. I have a full scholarship. I'm going. Uh, but that was after I spent five years in Pratham and I had some direction in which my, in, I think in terms of where I knew my interests uh, lay in sort of in data, in, in evidence, in research. Uh, and I said, as I said, you know, these experiences, you don't realize how it changes you as a person and a future professional, your attitude to life sort of changes without you realizing it. 
Uh, one of the few things I remember of my early years in Pratham was that you know no one really got any special treatment, whether you were a research associate or a village volunteer or a program head. Uh, everyone was put, expected to put in more than that 100%. And that has taught me humility, which has sort of stayed with me throughout. Uh, we, we call it Ragra. The Ragra I went through really grounded me. And I would say a lot of people who, uh, and I know that you have a lot of uh, Pratham folks also uh, in your team, uh, they will of, of course attest to it. And one of the early experiences I have, which are one of my favorite ones, are a small group of us were, you know, with along with an intern, were literally sent off to start the first Asar surveys in 2005 in the northeastern states. This was between October to December. And very excitedly, again, you know, everything was an adventure for me at that point of time. I armed with the printer and a lot of, you know, entrepreneurship spirit because we had to find partners there to work with us, you know, from scratch. Uh, you know, call this person, call that person. They'll give you some contact, call them, go meet them, tell them about Asar, bring them on board, train them. So all of that we had to do, just four of us and, and uh, five of us actually. With the Indian, and I, you know, I traveled to all sorts of places. And I remember, you know, we were. I was applying to LSE at that point of time, and I remember in Manipur, in Impal, they had had an 8 p.m. curfew. So I literally used to stand at the STD booth doing international calls because I had interviews going on at that point of time. And you know, we back at home in Delhi, I had a whole network of uh, friends and family who were sending off my application letters uh, for me. So you know, all sorts of. Uh, you know, I mean, lots of experiences at that point of time. Uh, you know, I traveled to many different parts of Bihar, which is my home state. But being a Bihari, I had not stepped out of Patna, and suddenly I was going from Betia to Purnia to uh, Jahanabad. You know, surveying children on buffaloes, participating in gram panchayat meetings. It was that time. It was still the Lalu regime, so Bihar in Bihar safety was an issue, and. You know, I was always surrounded by people, lots of people. So I didn't really feel unsafe, actually did not feel unsafe. Um, so anyway, I think I would just to say that the, this sort of set me up for what came later on. So my year at LSE, the, uh, the later on in JPAL, and my first couple of years in JPAL is what we very fondly refer to as the wild, wild west. Um, so uh, there's really just, you know, a group of researchers, some associates, you know, trying to do the best we can in the field with the resources we had. Um, so, and the other, other point I would say in terms of shaping my future choices was my decision to join JPAL. That was a conscious one, along with going to LSE, uh, you know, for that multidisciplinary course that I took. So I, I met Esther at an econ conference in London while I was studying at LSE. And she recognized me from the time that I was in Pratham because she was doing some field work with Rachel and Abhijit in Jaunpur and Gauri Ganj in Western UP. A very interesting project, actually. It was focusing on... Uh, sort of direct action by communities in participating in planning to solve their own problems. In this case, it was education. So the question here was, you know, is more direct action um, by communities to teach their children um, to learn to read more effective? So can they take control of the situation and, and uh, you know, solve for themselves and enact change? Uh, at that point of time, again, we were beginning to solve for enrollment but you know, not realizing that learning, but we were also realizing that learning was a huge problem. And, and I think we had, this was 2005, six, when we found that you know, more than 56% of children in grade uh, five could not read grade two level text. So these are some of the ways in which we depict the ASAR surveys. Uh, and then 20% you know, of kids in class five could not read grade two level text. So in, you know, this is the, the problem that we were solving for and working directly with the communities to do that, creating the village report cards and. Uh, you know, having discussions in these uh, you know, gram panchayat meetings and so on and so forth. Uh, so as, anyway, so Esther recognized me from that period and she invited me for a cup of tea because this was a JPAL project at, at that point of time, but JPAL South Asia wasn't even there. It was just JPAL in, in uh, at the global office. And three weeks later after meeting Esther for a cup of coffee, I didn't even know it was, a, it was an interview. We just had a cup of coffee and chatted with her. I had an offer to join her on a project in uh, Berhampur in Orissa. So again, I had never been to Orissa. So the first thing I did was to look up what I can do there, what is the most exciting thing to find there. And I found all of these turtles. I'm a, I'm a nature enthusiast and, and a wildlife enthusiast. And I immediately said, okay, you know, on the off chance that I can go see these uh, olive ridley turtles, I'm going to go to Orissa and spend my, whatever, however many years I have there. So they have, olive ridley turtles have four nesting places in the world, three of which are in Orissa. So that was very exciting for me. Anyway, so I would say the two years as, an, as a research associate in Orissa, working with uh, Esther on this, uh, you know, health project that again was 
a transformative experience for me, very, in a way, different from Pratham, because in Pratham, I was surrounded by seniors, mentors, guides, and colleagues. Uh, in Here in Orissa, in Bhairampur, it's a small town by the sea. I was four or five hours from Bhuvaneshwar. I was all by myself, uh, a young girl in charge of a small team of four detention operators and about 25, 30 surveyors, uh, all speaking Odia. They did not know I was Bengali, and they, I didn't, they didn't realize that I could understand what they were saying. So then at some point of time, the penny dropped because I could understand what they were saying. Um, there was a lot of fun. It's, it's, a, it's my favorite. I remember every person from that team. I'm still in touch with uh, many people. So anyway, I, you know, I, at that point of time, you have to suddenly reprioritize your life choices. So I did not get accommodation. I had to live out of a room in the office, in the JPAL office. Uh, so I, you know, I bought a bed, a secondhand AC, a mosquito tent, which I would pitch in villages when I went on field visits. Um, I remember going with my surveyor to buy a Western style uh, toilet for my bathroom because it didn't have any. Then when I, and then, you know, when I, I remember, you know, there were weekends when nobody was there to talk to. So I, I'm sure a lot of the RAs today will have symbol. I don't think the field has really changed so much, uh, though a lot of you would you know, don't have to go off to Bharampur and spend two years alone. You probably are based in Bhuvaneshwar and travel to the field. Uh, but I was there alone. And then when I used to get lonely, I used to go to the ICSA ATM and talk to people at the over the counter in English. Everybody knew me because at that time, point of time, we had to handle large amounts of cash. So, you know, they, so I used to be taking out like little rewards of cash and going and distributing it amongst the uh, surveyors. So, uh, so the, all of that, uh, you know, those were the system. No, there were no systems actually at that point of time. I think it's over the years that we've sort of matured and created these systems. And of course, the, the regulatory environment has changed in India considerably as well. And the ease of business is much better. Um, and then I, I also knew, for instance, all of the security airport personnel at the Bhuvaneshwar airport, because when I should travel from Bharam to Bhuvaneshwar and take a flight to Chennai to, to fix all the health equipment, uh, it would always show up in these, uh, you know, all, all their checks. So anyway, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but a couple of years later, I bumped into uh, a, one of the CISF guards in Calcutta airport when I was waiting for a flight to Dhaka. He gave me a cup of tea. He recognized me. He gave me a cup of tea. Um, and that time I was and working in Dhaka because IBM Bangladesh was just setting up and I was doubling up as a research associate uh, for Rachel, for Rachel Grenster, for her project in Bangladesh on women and girls empowerment. And they were looking at a very interesting project again, delaying the age of marriage uh, in, in Bangladesh, working with Save the Children. So I worked there for two years with her and I used to travel very frequently every three, four, five months. I was, uh, you know, I had to go to Dhaka and then take a overnight boat to remote villages of Bangladesh. It's a fantastic experience again. And then later on, I think as a research manager, you know, the, uh, I, though I was removed from the actual RA kind of work, I traveled frequently to the field. And, you know, I, I enjoyed working alongside my survey team members. And I think a lot of the sort of the work that I did in, in Pratham sort of grounded me for this life in the field you know, going from a community to being by myself. And that, I, I think that also in a way shaped my resilience, my perseverance as well. Um, I mean, and, and again, I think spending time in the communities that we worked with, in Pratham, I was not a researcher, I was an implementer. In, in DFL, I was a researcher. So looking at it from both aspects, uh, also really sort of taught me respect in terms of there has to be a little bit of a distance as a researcher, which you don't need to really have as, as an implementer. Uh, so, you know, there are little constraints as well as I would say uh, trade-offs in, in both approaches. And you learn so much about, you know, when you're talking to the people that you're working with and, and doing research with, you learn so much about, you know, politics, the world, people's beliefs and aspirations uh, that you can't get from looking at uh, numbers at the end of the day and you do adjust your priors. Uh, so I think I'll just quickly end with, you know, you also talked about what motivated me. And so the, I would say the organization professionally speaking uh, had a lot to do with my professional journey but equally important were the people sort of in, who influenced me during this journey. And they continue to influence me. Uh, you know, first and foremost, I think that, you know, Rukmini had to do with the law. Rukmini is the CEO of Pratham. Uh, she was a program head for North India at that point of time when I had joined Pratham. And I think that she had a lot to do with shaping my thinking when I was just starting out and figuring things for myself. Um, and then I was Esther's research associate for over two years when I was working in Odessa on a health project. So we used to have fortnightly calls, like weekly and fortnightly calls, discussing every single chulha in Bahrampur, 4,500 chulhas, you know, treatment control, spillover, attrition, you know, all of those things, right? And, but I just really got to understand her thinking through, through those conversations. 
and both rukmini and esther are very practical people interestingly you know i remember at one point of time and there was like a uh fun moment so to speak was that i was working as a gpl research manager evaluating pratham's uh, flagship read india project where i had my um, sort of former boss and my current boss both working along with me so i had rukmini with pratham and esther with jpl so they were both my bosses so i think what has worked for me is that i have had very strong uh, women leaders who i met early on in my career and both of whom had had huge influences in my life over the last two decades i have learned a lot from them i have learned from their approach to work it's very practical very humble very practical there's a job that needs to be done so just go and do it no matter what it takes what are you you know what is this quantification about uh, and the point of view was that there are many ways to approach a solution find the best way and go on with it uh, as, you know esther you probably would have heard this but esther says that we are uh, plumbers and we focus on nuts and bolts instead of sort of being overwhelmed by the enormity of the problem uh, and that's really what my approach has been to anything that even in jpal it turned me that the lot that we're trying to do uh, institutionally and i just you know tackle one thing at a time uh, i have a fantastic stellar team that's supporting me uh, and i'm hope i hope i've been able to pass on some of sort of my learning and my intuitions to them as well unfortunately i don't have you know the sharp wit of esther and rukmini but you know, i'm working on it Thanks so much, Shobini. That was quite expansive, and in fact, answers a lot of questions I had for you uh, upcoming. So I'll try to also combine a few questions uh, because I'm cognizant of time. It's honestly amazing to see someone be so humble and so upfront and so honest about their challenges. I don't think we hear about that as often. So it's great that you spoke about all that. Uh, just building on the theme of your 20s a little bit more what professional advice would you give to yourself in your 20s and since a lot of people in this group are either applying for masters or phd programs can you talk a bit about your decisions of pursuing the courses you did and also the courses you presumably had the option to but did not uh, and how do you think people should identify their interests at such an early phase in their career got it um okay so you want me to talk a little bit about the phd and about sort of how do you think about identifying what you want to uh, what you want to do so i think you know a lot of it for me is going to be for you know looking back in terms of how i made those decisions at that point of time i've already told you that at 20 i did not really have a clue as to what i was doing but i think by 25 by by 30 definitely uh, i knew what direction i was headed in and i started making these choices consciously for myself because by then i had already spent five years in pratham i had finished my degree at sci i had joined jpal i had already spent a few years there uh, so i think i'll just you know i'll take it from several different dimensions of and you can tell me if that makes sense for you uh, before jumping into a phd i'll take a step back and talk about how do you identify interest in the first place because phd at the end of the day is one path that you're taking and that's one field of interest for you now the now the development sector i would say over the last decade or so or even two decades has changed a lot um and you know you have to be able to try different things for yourself to be able to make that choice for yourself i'm always i would say you know i'm going to say this again that i'm continually impressed by how driven many of you are today because i'm from a generation that did not have the kind of resources and access to information that you have today so you have a lot more networks and opportunities to make those choices for yourself and i stopped stumbled upon it and then started making those decisions for myself so you know it might have not have taken me 20 years to get where i am i don't know uh, so i think one advice is that you should try to do as many things possible in the exploration phase uh, you know people say that internships are the best way to understand what you like whether you like what you're doing and i think that worked for me when i interned with pratham uh, try different interning at different kinds of organizations and i talk a little bit about that as well before you finally decide where you want to land and at that phase don't get stuck with names and labels uh, and also leverage technology you can do remote internships for in, for example use this what you have today the resources your networks uh, you know the internet to find out what different organizations are doing in this space the so there are, and again find a mentor i mean i had fantastic mentors talk to them regularly for for advice um so i think let me unpack what i'm saying in terms of what kind of organizations what are the opportunities how do you identify uh, what your interests are uh, 
so you know again you don't have to settle for doing one thing at a time for instance say only research or only policy or you know or a particular sector within that um and first i think it's important to find out what is the philosophy that drives you or if there is an issue that drives you so i enjoy you know i have a lot of experience in education but i enjoy work engaging with the evidence in other fields so the evidence is what drives me uh, not so much as a sector of course there are some sectors that i'm less interested in some i'm more interested in and that always will happen but define the role that you want to play that should cross cut the sector and the organization and the function Uh, so you have main team NGOs like Pratham or Seva Mandir or Bandhan, for instance, who work on specific issues. But within these, there are many different roles you can play. So there's a programmatic field-based role, there's a data-oriented role, uh, there's a content and pedagogy role, policy and research. Uh, you have think tanks, for instance, uh, working on issues of public affairs and governance. Center for Policy Research is one such example. Uh, you have organizations, of course, like uh, JPAL. Who work at the intersection of policy and research on on which our focus is on you know desiring interesting solutions uh, towards reducing poverty and driving adoption for uh, proven solutions. You have you know again the kind of work you're doing in in Good Business Lab. It also works at the inter intersection of research and policy. So uh, you know for if you think about a career in policy, you have many options today with organizations like ours or like or an NGO where you can work on the policy space or the research space. uh but you can also work directly with governments so if you want to be closer to the action it really depends on what whether you like the action whether you like the research uh whether you you know so for instance i know a lot of uh, youngsters who come in you know who ask me about what about should we go and join the delhi governments delhi development dialogues commission and i said of course go for it because if you want to be if you want to see policy making from a very you know sort of uh, upfront granular lens that's the place where you want to be uh, you can be a consultant in a department in a government department dme the the dmo which is the department of monitoring and evaluation and niti aayog also hires for uh, a lot of consultants there's the prime minister's rural development fellow uh, there's you know they work directly with district level administrations they work with policy makers they work at the center so you know it, it really depends on how you want to, where you want to land finally and again try different things spend some time trying to figure out in the early years no amount of uh, you know no amount of time you spend learning is going to be lost time is how i look at it uh, choose basically i would say where you land up you want to also choose an organization that's aligned with uh, your values whether you're talking about an issue or a philosophy that's dear to you uh, or a place that you want to be where you are you feel you're learning or you're mentored or have colleagues that you can work well with uh, for a career in research and i now let me come to the phd very quickly you don't always have to link a career in academia to doing a phd uh, you have to link a career in academia academia to doing a phd but not necessarily uh, you know that should not be the only thing that's possible for you to do i have for instance i've come uh, to the crossroad of phd twice in my life and both times i was turned away from it by my advisors so do a, do a phd if you really and this is what i tell everyone who asks me do a phd if you have a burning because i was told the same thing do a phd if you have a burning question and you have the drive to see it through it's a lonely road which you have to undertake by yourself people can support you but you have to complete it yourself you are giving up 5 to 7 years of your life uh, to that so you have to be cognizant of that uh, a mentor is very important a good mentor is very important for a phd so when i went to rukmini for instance after 5 years in pratham for advice on a phd uh, she her point was you want to done more than what a phd can offer you at uh, pratham why do you want to do it now i went to do my course at lse came back joined jpal went to esther after 2 years asked her the same question and she said exactly the same thing um so i think and let me also tell you why i chose my lse course because that is really i think you have to form us you have to see what defines you or what drives you is it practice is it policy is it research and how you want to then uh, sort of narrow that down so i chose this lse course actually because i wasn't sure i wanted to really uh, study develop a development econ degree because that would have put me on a fixed path which i did not know where it was taking me the course was so the the course i did was uh, the so social research methods course was an applied research methods and multidisciplinary that i could you know i could take uh, courses from different departments in addition to my core stats course so social policy qualitative methods dev econ so i spent a semester learning about qualitative research methods i learned software like nvivo and atlas i did a research study as well uh, it was a great mixture of many things which at that point of time suited me in my career now if i had to do that do another course today 
I might have said, okay, you know, maybe a public policy administration since my role has changed significantly since then. So don't go into a PhD because you think it will look good on your CV because at that point of time, I was probably going into it for the wrong reason. I thought, oh, great, you know, I'll have a Dr. Shobini Mukherjee in front of my name. And sometimes, you know, when I'm on panels, they sometimes put a doctor. <laughs> so I have to say, no, no, I'm not a doctor. Uh, but then, you know, you know, I have thought about this a lot and I realized that, you know, I've used a lot of my life experiences to enhance my learning. Um, and it was not, the, it, the, I was trying to have the PhD drive me for the wrong reasons. And it's a leg up, but very soon the advantage will be lost. And it's really up to you to create that space for yourself with or without that PhD is what I firmly believe. Uh, one way to cross that bridge is there's so much online today. There are shorter courses, there are online courses, there are, uh, you know, things that you can do. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of, I would say, you know, Indian institutions have a lot of multidisciplinary courses now, which cover different aspects. So, and again, of course, working in different spaces teaches you different things that a PhD can't. So unless you want to, unless you're very sure of a life in academia, um, only then go into it. And even then I would say theory will only ultimately take you that far. What we look for, for instance, our skills in a space like ours are, are a minimum understanding of economic concepts uh, or reading a regression table is important, but you don't need to get into the weeds of research. Uh, you, know, you don't need to do a PhD to get into the weeds of research as I would say, um, or to understand how this instrument variable was created or constructed or whatever. Um, and if you're hired, of course, if you're hired as, hired as a data analyst, then you will need to know ROS data or some programming. But I think a lot of it can be taught on the job. So I hope I've answered some questions for you, uh, Lavinia, on this. Yeah, and I think that's a great segue into a question uh, people submitted in the form and quite a few people do ask because not everybody comes from an economics background. You shared how you didn't pursue a master's in economics because you didn't want to limit yourself. Uh, how accepting do you think is the dev eco impact evaluation space in general for people from non-economics background and what would your advice to such people be who are looking to enter the space? Got it. Okay, so I'll say one thing here. I think it's a misconception uh, that that the dev econ space or the impact evaluation space is is uh, is not accepting of non-economic backgrounds. So I think it's not so much a question of the discipline as it is of a skill set and what you do with it while you are on the job. Uh, it's an entryway. I completely agree. It's an entryway. But for instance, fields like social epidemiology or behavioral sciences, uh, public health, uh, you know political scientists all use economics very differently for impact evaluations in their own work. So I would say economics is not the monopoly of impact evaluations and vice versa. I'm not an econ economist, uh, I use, but I use economics in my everyday work. It really depends how you think about, you know, about these things. So I think we should broaden the framework and talk about how the field of impact evaluation is open and accepting of other fields and degrees, which it increasingly is. Um, so, for instance, I can say in, in at least in Japan, we have a really a, we have a, we have, of course, econ degree holders uh, who are obviously going is it might be the majority of the bulk of it. But I really we haven't seen. But I think we would we were looking at some of the statistics uh, within Japan to see, you know, what are the kinds of degrees that people come in with? Because I think this is some this is of interest to me to understand how are we who are we hiring? What are we hiring for? How are we hiring? Uh, and I think what we realized is that. While econ does show up as a degree, a lot of uh, a lot of people who are who have applied to us and have also joined JPAL are from non-economic backgrounds. Uh, we have graduates from policy, uh, public public policy fields. We have graduates. We have you know, hired people from political science, public administration, development studies, humanities, uh, liberal arts, uh, anthropology, sociology. So all of these fields, and we have hired from them. So JPAL is, I would say representative of the larger ecosystem who is hiring uh, for these fields. And I think it's, again, I would say it's more and more the skills I would believe is what you look for. Uh, so a quick, quick example, the associate directors of research for JPAL, both of them are undergrads who are not in economics. One is an engineer and the other did English literature. Uh, the second degree that they did was in public policy. Uh, Shagun, who's our director of policy training and communications, and she's a PI on uh, quite a few studies. She has a public health degree from Harvard. And Vipin, who's our research head, who's our uh, research operations head, is has a degree in HR and then public policy. So I'm a firm believer that what you do with your skill set while you're on the job is more important. I, I learned uh, Stata, for instance, at LSE, but very rudimentary. 
uh, not enough. I don't think it would be enough to get me a, a data job in JPAL, for instance, but I learned on the job. I learned how to write my own do files. I did not have a manager in my first few years. I was the first manager in JPAL. And that was the case for Vipin and a few of the others who are now leading verticals today. Uh, so I, I would say that, you know, it's important to have an analytical mind, have the curiosity to go deep. I think we need to be better at being able to identify these skills uh, beyond the degrees. Uh, we also, and I, I really feel that uh, there's a, there's, a, you know, I think we can, we do hire for different skills. We do hire for different, uh, across different degrees. We need to do a much better job of being able to even sort of bridge that gap. Yeah, I think that there is one. <laughs> yeah, I think that's really well put. In fact, just the other day, I was reading a JPAL blog about marrying qualitative research with RCTs because there are times when you don't understand the why of an outcome necessarily through an RCT. And for that, you need people from the backgrounds that you mentioned, like anthropology, psychology. Uh, we do something similar at Good Business Lab as well. So definitely the space requires people from different backgrounds to solve problems. Um, great. So uh, actually That's moving great. into... <laughs> Moving into the impact evaluation research space broadly, I know this is something you're quite passionate about. So can you talk a bit more about how uh, the gap between research and putting it into practice can be bridged? Yeah, sure. I'm happy to do that. Uh, you know, I think this is, this is something that I'm deeply passionate about. Uh, this is something that is very much on top of uh, our agenda for JPAL, and it is my bread and, bread and butter. So I think uh, let me take a step back and talk to you a little bit about what the philosophy of uh, JPAL is, because that's really what our philosophy, what my philosophy is as well. And you know, if I if I think about how about what we the framework within which we put it, uh, we call it the framework of three eyes: ideology, inertia, and ignorance. And you would have also seen this in the poor economics book by Esther and Abhijit. And I have first, I have seen firsthand, for instance, where ideology comes in the way of sort of you know. Uh, responding to evidence or making a decision based on evidence. So I think about the gap in research and putting into practice. These are really, I would say, the uh, the barriers to be able to do it to, to be able to do that. We, you know, we've had situations where we have a policymaker sitting across the end of the table, who, within the first five minutes, you know that they are really driven by ideology. Whatever you say, what evidence you put across is not going to make a difference. So how do you persevere? How do you overcome that? Um, you know, I have many examples, but I think we're going to run short of time, so I will not get into any of my examples. But I think we, so I would say that there's a there's a way in which we have learned to overcome, you know, ignorance and inertia by, uh, you know, with information, with support, with access to evidence. Uh, but the biggest hurdle is has been ideology for us. It is very important to find a champion within the government that you're trying to influence, because. At, at the end of the day, you can solve for many things, but you can't solve for um, you know, disinterest or ideology. That's that's really difficult to do. You have to stick around, be there for the long game. You know, wait to see sign sign multi year MOUs, for instance, at the top, and signal long term partnership and commitments, um, and 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 uh, sort of have a top down have to, have a top down approach at that end. But equally important to work with the middle and bottom run if you want buy in and the changes to stick. Wait and hope that the person who's in charge gets transferred. You know, few few months down the line, you have a better person that you're able to work with to really drive that change. Hopefully, you know, with a little bit of uh, you know constant perseverance, even that person who had that ideology would turn around. Uh, but we've seen that it, it's a slow game. Evidence and data are very important in this game. For instance, to capture changes on the ground and to inform decision makers uh, at the top. Uh, and this is where you know you can say either action follows policy or policy can follow action. And I think in our case, we have been able to influence a lot of the actions based upon our evidence, which have later influenced policies as well. Uh, and policymakers, I would say at some point of time, they want to change, they want to pilot in their own context. And that's another way of influencing policy decisions. Uh, it's a little longer route to bridge the gap. It's a longer wait time, but it's really worth the wait if you're able to convince them and scale up. So. You know, the quick example I'll say is that over, you know, it took us about two to three years to convince the government of Bihar to to uh, sort of adopt this ultra poor uh, appro graduation approach for the ultra poor in Bihar. And we did a pilot for about two years in one or two districts of Bihar. The pilot showed uh, results. Then we, and we had the same policymaker we were working with, or maybe I think we had probably a change in the policymaker we were working with. 
but again, very good people. Finally, at the end, seeing results in those two districts, it also worked with a very good policy window, so political policy window that we saw when the government was due for re-elections. They made the ultra poor uh, program a part of the election agenda, and that really worked in our favor because when the governor of Bihar announced, uh, you know, I think a hundred million dollars to scale up the the ultra poor program across say 100,000 households in Bihar. And now they have committed more money to scale it up to 300,000 households across Bihar. They've included Mahadalits and they've also included uh, a section of population who have been uh, sort of affected by the, uh, by the liquor ban in Bihar. So, so again, you know, it's, you, there's a little bit of a give and take, but it's really worth it if you're able to convince them. And that's really you know, why we are in this in the first place. So this is like almost like with you know, the teaching at the right level approach that Rukmini has, which, which says, you know, you move from one level to the other level to the other level. And that's really what we're doing or, or the plumbing approach of Esther, for instance, is one, uh, one thing at a time so that you, you sort of solve for various things and you will probably, you will get to the end of it uh, at the end of the day. And I think it really depends on what the theory of change is. Uh, all of these are various uh, essential components in, the, in your theory of change that you should start out and really delineate in your impact journey. Uh, not all, and of course, I think I have to mention this, I should say this because not all research will lead to policy, policy decisions uh, being made based on that. And not because of the end product not being taken by a policymaker, but because they might, might not have been designed to influence policy always, uh, and which is fine. Some theoretical models or lab experiments are meant to push forward scientific thinking in a particular area uh, or even a method or in some behaviors. Uh, but it depends on what your theory of change is when you're designing that uh, research study. Yeah, definitely. That's super useful. And since we're on this topic, uh, how do you think we can implement better policy designs in a post-COVID world or current COVID world? <laughs> Ongoing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I think there are, there are many... Uh, um, I would say there are many things to look at, right? We have one thing, uh, I mean, two things that actually, two things that I will mention here is that in a post-COVID world, uh, we, there, are, there are two important things to take into account. The first and foremost is that I have personally seen that uh, policymakers are a lot more amenable to, to asking and demanding for this evidence than they were, say, two years ago. And that's simply because they, I think they are in need of solutions, they're in need of creative solutions uh, from the ecosystem. So whether it's from researchers, practitioners, implementers, uh, the entire stakeholder, I'm not just saying you know, the research community, but they, the policymakers, they're much more open to collaborating. And I saw a lot of collaboration during the last five and a half years, even within our ecosystem. Uh, within, you know, we ourselves collaborated with many other organizations, but I think this ecosystem really came together to solve for particular uh, need of the hour issues. And, and I hope that stays going forward because that is, we are really working in a collaborative space. But policymakers are also, I think, never before, I would say, has science and evidence come to the forefront of decision making. Uh, it was unfortunate that the pandemic had to bring us to this point, but people understand the need for evidence, the need for piloting, the need for data a lot better. You can see now, you know, every, every other day I'm hearing of this, uh, um, you know, uh, whatever. So some data said that the government wants to create some, you know, they're creating all of this, uh, the migrant uh, database and all of that. So it's, all of these come with their own sets of, uh, you know, issues, but at least we are, there's, a, there's, an, uh, there's an acknowledgement and an acceptance that we need evidence, we need to solve for many problems. And what are the problems we need to solve it for? I think, you know, jo um, learning loss, job losses, um, you know, looking at financial burdens that are going to increase on communities, uh, looking at, you know, we are talking about gender and climate as becoming, uh, you know, big problems into the future. The IPCC report that has been just, it's a very stark report that squarely puts blame on us for the situation that we are in today. Uh, gender is going to be, it's cross-cutting, but also very much its own uh, field where you're looking at diverse impacts of uh, the COVID uh, scenario on, on, uh, on women. Uh, if you look at the rapid urbanization that we're having, but at the same time, you know, how, how villages are being left behind even more so now. So there's a whole host of issues that we need to solve for. And I think we can only do it working in a collaborative space uh, as we are right now and being sort of being open to, um, you know, creating a much, I would say a much more 
friendly uh, space to be able to I've worked together on on some of these issues. I don't know if I've so, you know, answered some of what you want, but uh, this is and uh, this is how I feel. Yeah, you have, and I'm cognizant of time. And since this is women in econ and policy, I'm going to shift gears a little bit towards the gender and inclusivity aspect. So, as a woman yourself, what kind of uh, learnings have you uh, amassed in terms of combating sexism and how do you pass on those learnings and be an ally to other women? Okay, so I'll, I'll say that you know, professionally, um, I have not really had that much of, uh, uh, I mean, I would say professionally or even personally, I don't think I, I've been fortunate not to, not to have come across or being discriminated against because of my gender. So it might be because of the organizations that I've worked with. So Pratham and Jaypal both have very strong women leaders, but they also have a lot of women staff across the board. Um, and, and, you know, we work with economists where we are they're traditionally more men than economists than women, but I think, you know, we've not really faced that, that distance. Uh, you might have a mixed bag, say, where private companies are, are concerned, or maybe in the larger development econ space, I'm, I don't know. Uh, but, you know, I think the, I've not openly experienced it. I have not been, I don't feel that there is, uh, the sexism hasn't really been very, uh, very perverse. But I think what having said that, I did feel, that, you know, as, as a woman growing up in India, you will feel that there are situations that you come across where you might not be comfortable with the way things are. Uh, and, you know, I have been in, in meetings or even now these webinars, uh, for instance, where I feel that my voice has to be heard, not because, you know, I'm so many trying to have my voice, but because it's like, you know, all the men talking to each other, right? So you have to be able to push through that. And I, I, it, it's there. It's, you, you, you can't help it. I think it's just the way our societies have been built because it's, we, are, we are in this, in this sort of, uh, there's a whole society around us that dictates many things. You know, walk into a room, it's in a government meeting, it's full of uh, men. Uh, whether it's a meeting of bureaucrats or you know, middle level officials, you have to learn to be resilient. You have to learn to be persisting. You have to be able to uh, hold your own. So I know there are many things I do. I, I take time to reduce myself. I sit as close as I can to the head of the table. I mention my, I mention my credentials, my you know, 13 years in JPAL. So all of that really does matter. Uh, make sure that you know, you, you, it does not matter if you, you know, what age you are, but you need to know the subject matter going into a meeting you need to be able to speak uh, sort of you know, confidently about, about what your work is and being able to input into the conversation. Uh, I've almost, sometimes I do feel unfairly that we have a little bit, uh, I would say harder uh, than anyone else to be able to sort of prove ourselves. Uh, that's the unfortunate part, but you know, that's not discrimination. I think that's no one's discriminating against me. I think it's just the fact that it might just be me feeling like that in that moment. Uh, and you just need to get over with it and not, not quantificate or feel marginalized, but just really you know uh, make your voice heard and, and, and that's really how I feel uh, the I think in terms of uh, you know supporting other women in this in this uh, you know some and I'm really impressed by one particular program I think what you guys are doing is fantastic in terms of the ecosystem that you're creating for other uh, you know young women starting out in this field uh, to be able to hear from you know people like me or others who have spoken before me to be able to have this network that you're creating across uh, the country, uh, you know, 1300 women as a part of this network, I can imagine how many more networks that you have and, and the support that you're providing. Like I said, I'm really, you know, following what you guys are doing really closely because I'm really uh, impressed by the kind of uh, change that they're trying to make and the social connections they're trying to build and the support systems. Uh, there's another program that I'll mention that I really am impressed by is this Vedika Women's, uh, you know, Vedika Women's, MBA for, for women, Vedika MBA for women. I think I'm getting it, getting it incorrect, but uh, so they have this, you know, whatever this 18 month MBA and they have women scholars who are there. They have a six week shadow uh, mentorship with women leaders. So in three years in a row now, I have had a person, a young, you know, 25 year old or 26 year old, a few years into their jobs shadowing me. And that's been a fantastic experience for both them and for me. Uh, and, and I feel like I'm, in a way, I'm supporting and, and sort of downloading some of my um, sort of experiences to that person as well. But I'm also learning from them because this, it's great to be connected to what this generation thinks and does as well. 
So anyway, I think some of these programs work really good to sort of create that ecosystem. Yeah, those are great tips. I've noted those down. In fact, I was going to ask you, how do you make yourself heard? And I think you went through the practical tips quite well. Uh, last question, I know we're uh, close to time. Um, how are you working on making j South Asia more diverse and inclus inclusive? So I, I think you're, you're uh... So I, would say that I think this is very much on top of our minds, um, but I think we need to define what this means a bit better. So you know, there are very these are very broad terms to use, can have many different meanings. We have to identify what we think is the problem statement first to be able to solve for that, right? So like likewise, I can answer it in many different ways. The way we think about it is is when we think about representation and inclusion, uh, JPL is very much again, a representation of the larger ecosystem within which we operate, both in its uh, research agenda, uh, policy and staffing. Uh, we've been always agnostic to politics surrounding ideology or any political agenda. We don't define ourselves or attach ourselves to that. Uh, we believe that everyone has a voice, whether it's in our research or in our organization. And we want to work on issues that are front and center to policy priorities for our country um, and, and for our stakeholders and staff members. For me, I think we are more passionate about having, you know, engaging with people for whom evidence-based decision-making is their agenda. Uh, so having said that, you know, we've been a relatively flat organization throughout, uh, even from the time that I started. Uh, and even particularly over the last year, I think we've tried to do many things very differently. We've, uh, you know, we've brought together staff members on a regular basis to interact and share their views with each other, uh, include them in important conversations, uh, talk about important issues within and outside the organization. We used to have these weekly and fortnightly calls. We, you know, to get regular inputs into our strategies internally and for the organization. Um, we create a lot of, even now, I would say that our policies have been sort of co-created with staff from the very beginning. Uh, we value everyone's voice. We create lots of working groups. We let staff drive several inputs, which later translate into policies, into whatever the frameworks that we are creating. Uh, very simple examples I can give you is that we created a paternity policy for one month because after some eight years of existence, we had a very young father who requested additional time off to support his wife in her first few weeks of delivery. So we were like, you know, why don't we just make a policy out of this? Uh, why do we have to take additional, you know, two weeks to, to support his wife? Then we've created these floating holidays for staff to take any religious or cultural holiday beyond the ones that are fixed in our calendar uh, that are gazetted or by IFMR. And then we allow different holidays for cultural events across different parts of India. So Northeast, Southwest. Um, so this is how we try and bring in sort of, you know, inclusion, I would say. Our entire, you know, values, competencies, framework, performance evaluations have been designed by staff members across the organization. So I hope it reflects the culture of learning uh, within the organization that we have. We have mental health frameworks, for instance, uh, in place, which, um, you know, what we sort of, which are, Again, we are looking at it from, from the space of applying it to all of the policies that we have currently. And we very tried very hard in the last two years to sort of you know, destigmatize mental health as an issue or a taboo. Uh, and then we have a lot of, I think you know, if you look at diversity, we have a lot of women in Japan, I, you know, within research and policy, but also in the finance group, for instance. Uh, I think we can do a little bit more in our research operations teams because we have very good op you know, research operations field team leaders women leaders who've sort of moved up the ranks, but I think there's a lot more we can do uh, to bring diverse, gender diversity in the middle rung of our field leadership. So that, that we are cognizant of and that JPAL gender group has identified some really interesting ways in which we can do this, you know, that we want to work towards. Um, and then I think lastly, I'll say taking a step back, I, like I said, I think while I say that we are reflective of the development space, we also face issues similar to other organizations. I think it's important to first define what the baseline is, what the problem statement is when we think about inclusion and diversity before we even start doing anything about it. Um, and then, you know, and it, it, it will vary from context to context. Uh, so we have, you know, if you think of it's multidimensional, so you can think about, you know, whether it's caste or religion, gender, degrees, colleges, um, you know, foreign and US universities, Indian universities, so many different di dimensions, I would say, uh, Lavinia. So I think I don't think we can solve for everything at once, but tackling one thing at a time is what my approach has always been. Uh, so for instance, you know, way back in 2007 and till say 2011, we had a mix of both foreign and Indian staff members, almost 50-50. Uh, 
Uh, today we have 98% Indians who are uh, you know part of our uh, staff member, part of our staff. Uh, even say five years ago, we had more tier one university applicants. And you know, like I said, we, we just did a recent analysis. One of our RAs, in fact, did the analysis for us, our recruitment analysis, and we found that amongst the Indian university applicants who joined JPAL, it's again a 50-50 ratio between tier one and non-tier one universities. And this is just taking in the technical fields, not even the non-technical fields like you know, admin finance or HR. Uh, again, I had talked about various courses that we that we have a good mix of courses. So I think if we take JPAL as a whole, we will get you will get a good mix of people from diverse socioeconomic backgrounds. Uh, but you know, I just want to understand, you know, what is it when we think of what the problem statement is, are we thinking about the pool? Are we thinking about is it the access to information that we need to solve for to bring in more diversity? What is the diversity that we're talking about? And how do we even sort of um, address that? So if you, if you forget about GPAL for a minute and if you look at who's applying for these jobs, it would be useful, for instance, to see how we can expand our net to continue to make sure that we reach a wider stream of people from diverse backgrounds. Uh, make the access easier to an organization like ours that someone sitting, uh, you know, I don't know, in Gauri Ganj, for instance, when I was in Gauri Ganj, might not have heard of or thought about applying to an organization like ours. So I think understandably, I, one might argue that the social networks might bring in the same kind of people who are similar. Uh, so one way to overcome this is to do what we did this year in JPAL, which I'm really excited about, is that we did a virtual recruitment webinar. Again, we are leveraging technology. This is something that we've not done before because we used to go to different colleges and only target a few colleges because we had finite time, finite resources to go and travel. So about 650 people had signed up for this recruitment webinar, about 450 plus attended. And we had you know, 160 plus colleges, 30 plus locations across India, many in the non-tier one brackets. We want to do this again as many times as possible. Uh, these are small steps, but I'm hoping that we reach a much wider net. And, and this is what I'm comfortable doing because we have the baseline data for this. Um, but I would be more cautious, I would say, Lavinia, I think you've not asked me this, but I would be more cautious to move in the direction of religion and caste till I understand what the problem statement is better for uh, an ecosystem like ours, for, for the, the, you know, the, again, the external environment within which we operate. Uh, the, I think there are some ways in which we do outreach should speak to accessing more such diverse communities in the future. And I'm very interested in understanding how to do that. And I think I am also would love to know more about, you, and this is offline, but about your internship program, for instance, that you guys are doing uh, for people from underprivileged and back, diverse backgrounds, because I think you're, and, and to understand from you, what are you really solving for? Because I think you're solving for a very interesting uh, problem as well. And, and you're sort of taking it, you know, you're giving a, you know, a sort of a step up, right? And, and these are conversations I think we should have more together as a part of the existing uh, broader ecosystem drawing from, you know, because we draw from similar pools and we face very similar challenges. Our North America office, for instance, of JPAL has created these several policies that speak to, uh, you know, the problem statement that they have identified of color and race. And they have, they have changed the hiring processes as a result, some of which includes how you screen CVs and so on. We can learn a lot from them as well. Contexts are different and we should be able to account for that, but sort of understand what they have done, how has it worked for them. Um, and I think our last I'll say is that you know, reservation policies come with a set of challenges. So as we're thinking about, you know, quotas and affirmative action in private organizations like ours, I think we have to proceed with caution. There's an entire, entire external ecosystem that operates. Uh, we don't, we, we, I think we don't want to box ourselves in to that ecosystem and to the regulatory environment. And that's another, another thing that I would caution us. Um, and of course, I think I'm, I'm totally for giving a level playing field, giving access, because I've said this before, I think entry is, is once you are in the system, entry is based on your skills, your attitude, it should be on your skills, aptitude and attitude. We should be able to hire and screen much better for these attributes. Um, you need grit in field research, as many of the RRAs in JPAL would say. Uh, you need the right skills for the role. And I think we can do better in identifying that. Our processes should be sensitive, perhaps not blind. And, and I think once, once, you know, in your, once you are in an organization, your work should speak for you. And I'm, I hope that we have this diversity um, even now and into the future and inclusive uh, environment, I would say. Yeah, I think you've broken it down pretty well. And since you mentioned the GVL research internship program, first of all, I'm glad you are aware of it. And to be honest, GVL is at a much smaller scale. We're four years old, so we're still dipping our feet. Uh, we're still kind of figuring out a lot of the problem statements that you mentioned. We haven't 
figure that out and we're in a trial phase. So we actually tried out anonymized hiring for one of our roles, which is where you uh, basically remove the name, college, those kind of demographics from a person's CV and screen them only based on their skill for the first round of screening and only if they perform well, well on the skill-based questions, they move on to uh, subsequent rounds. Uh, as a trial, we also did the affirmative action policy for our research internship. Uh, and the idea was that uh, people from Dalit, Bahujan, Adivasi backgrounds are underrepresented in the research uh, domain. And we're still analyzing data. We're still kind of talking to our employees. We're also seeing the career trajectory of people we are hiring under these policies to kind of come to any kind of a conclusion. And I think it's always a work in progress in that sense. Fantastic. I'd love to know more about it. Yeah, for sure. We can take that offline. Cool. Anahita messaged me. Last question that uh, Women in Econ Policy asks all uh, the speakers, what is it that you're reading right now? <laughs> So I, okay, I'm reading. I, you know, I'm reading three different books. Um, I so, you know, this is this is because I have I have finite time. I don't have enough time in the day to be able to read. So when I start something, you know, I'm like, okay, I want to take in all of this at once. So I'm reading one book called uh, Sapiens. So it's not the book Sapiens. It's actually there's a graphic novel which has been created. The book I started with the book, but it was just too thick and I lost heart. So I. Then I saw that there's a graphic novel, so I'm reading the graphic novel *Sapiens*. Um, and then I have just started reading this uh, book. I, I forget the author. Like I keep forgetting. I'll just uh, this one. Uh, it's by it's it's by Ghazala Wahab. It's called uh, *Born a Muslim*, and it's about it, it talk, talk, speaks to some truths about Islam in India. So I can't really you know say much about it, but I've just started reading it because it's uh, it's very interesting to think about two dimensions, both you know, Muslim as well as being a woman uh, growing up uh, in a country like ours. So that's these are the two books that I'm very different, but also in a way uh, connected with each other. Uh, Sapiens is fantastic because I would say that the graphic novel, everyone should read the graphic novel. I am reading excerpts of it to my seven-year-old daughter uh, who looks at me very quizzically sometimes, but it's so beautifully and so well explained there. That's my modern version of Waiting for Godot, but not really Waiting for Godot. Uh, I'm really enjoying that. That's amazing. Thanks so much, Shobini, for being so honest, so frank, and just sharing so many of your learnings. I enjoyed this a lot. I feel super inspired. Uh, I'll hand it back to Anahita to close the session. Thank you so much, uh, both Shobini and Lavanya. I think like echoing what Lavanya said, thank you so much for the honesty and just for being so open. And it, I think I really enjoyed the session and I, I'm get, already getting messages from people saying this was such a wonderful session. So thank you so much, Shobini. We really love, this is why we love to host senior women because we can, it's just so inspiring to hear all of your stories. Um, you just called out my gray hair and Ahita by calling me senior. <laughs> Sorry, I meant like senior in the sector. So uh, no, but thank yeah, you. I'm just pulling your leg. I'm just pulling <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and also thank you to Lavanya for taking the time out and for moderating and for hosting such an engaging session. I will and just good close. questions, hard questions. Yeah. Yeah, I will uh, close by telling everybody stay tuned. Um, we hope to host more sessions going forward. And yeah, we hope you enjoyed today. Thank you so much once again. Thank you.